you're probably wondering how I got myself into this mess. Well, to tell that story, we have to go back. back, 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 back. Back, back, back. Welcome to end of financial year at MAB Innovation. I've been playing with auctions. <coughs> Did you know, not everyone likes cramming themselves into the back of a 76 series to go camping. I'm not going to sleep in your fucking car. Some people insist on glamping somewhat, which has resulted in this video series. Now unfortunately, I've had a bit of an accident, which has resulted in a large white creature arriving at my workshop. Hi. No, a different one. Not that one either. So what better excuse to try and make something cool to abuse on my travels? So now that it's finally here, Let's figure out what to do with this happy accident. Well, let's find out how healthy it is. So ever since the auction house took a big chunk of money from me, I've been planning what I can do with this troop carrier. Now I want to turn it into the most sublime and delightful troop carrier the world ever saw, without using excessive arrogance or a South African accent. And so far, this is the plan. But you might currently see a problem with this plan. How are you supposed to glamp with all these ridiculous seats in the way? So that means the first step in this process is to tear everything out, take all the seats out, and see how bad the floor is. So I guess let's go.
comes a point in every project where nylock through bolts are just frustrating. And this is where grinders come in handy. So now everything's suitably loose, it's time for a throwback to a previous video. So I guess this is what we're working with. It's not amazing, but it's not particularly bad. The worst bit seems to be in the footwells here. But I've had a little dig around and actually on the camera it looks much worse than it is. So this is a combination of a bit of surface rust and some gravel. So once I clean all this up you should see that it's pretty much okay. The only weird thing is I'm not sure why this is all painted gold. And then the back seems to be a combination of gold and white. But, you know, 70s colour schemes. So I've seen much worse in vehicles, so I'm not too put off by this, as it was pretty much expected from the start. So the next course of action is to attack it with this, and this, and see if I can clean it up and make it not look awful. So this is what I was talking about with this mysterious brown paint. I almost think it's carpet glue or something, but as you can see, it scrapes off and there's perfectly clean paint underneath. Anyway, more housework. Well, they expected the worst, but it wasn't so bad. It's just somebody tore off the membrane. Can you imagine if someone made a flip-up table that mounts here? Amazing! So that's about all I'm willing... 
So that's about all we've got time for today. As you can see, I've got a lot of work ahead of me, and I'm sure nobody wants to watch me spend the rest of the day cleaning goop out of this car. In the next video, I'll be painting everything that needs painting and making all the interior panels again, and maybe some floor. So until then, you've just spent this long watching someone do housework. So you want to see a troop carrier conversion? Well, if this is your first time, there's part one. But this is part two. So since you were last here, I've been doing some of this, and this, and this, and this. Which has left me with a rather nice area to start building on. Just for some comparison, here's a before and after. So why didn't I video this process? Well, nobody wants to watch paint dry even though it would still be more exciting than a gender reveal video. You cut that out now, or you'll go home in an ambulance. So now that's all done, what am I doing today? Well, not a lot until I order some parts. So now that the parts have arrived, the first thing on the list is... Sound deadening. So this stuff is sound deadening. What does it do? Well, if you don't know... So in case you didn't know, troopies are relatively large. So I've decided not to sound deaden the entire vehicle, simply because the main cabin is already gonna have its own insulated flooring, so there's no point in insulating here. So what I'll do is I'll sound and deaden up to this point, which is where the front bit of the vinyl carpet ends. So those eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that I've already started. Well, the reason for this is because I've only just remembered that I could get some internet points. I'm also using 10 millimeters of foam. And as a result, I'm not using a roller because it seems pointless at this thickness.
So with that progressing nicely, I can now start to put the first bit of the carpet back in. Just one thing if you're doing this make sure you leave all these holes here so this one this one this one and this one are seat mounts and these ones are seat belt mounts Amazingly, all this effort and nothing looks different. Moving on. So I guess this signifies the first bit of the interior that I've done, rather than being Toyota factory nonsense. So I'm going to carpet all of this, similarly to what I've done here, do that all across around here, and then I'll get started on the flooring for the back, or the base of the floor anyway. So what's next on the list? Well.
Now when Toyota makes these door cards, they make them out of absolute crap. It's some kind of weird wooden mix. And once they get wet for the first time, they swell, deteriorate, and become very brittle. So I'm gonna remake these and hope they're a little bit better. Now I'm gonna be using this stuff. This is PVC foam. It seems to be just as rigid, but it's made out of plastic rather than wood. So it'll be more waterproof and hopefully last a bit longer than Toyota's attempts. Not so bad for a first attempt. So I guess we gotta see I guess we gotta see if it fits. Don't let me get carried away so I don't get carried away to be buried and lay in the dirt. My man for what is And surprise surprise, it fits beautifully. It's almost like I planned this. So I'll get started on the other side and see how that goes. I try to put everybody that I love first. Don't let me get carried away so I don't get carried away to be buried and lay in the dirt. My man for what it's worth, I try to put everybody that I love first. And I don't make music for the masses, but I always fit a track for a casket. Though I probably never sell amounts massive, I will always try to give you something classic. And that's real, even if I'm dead broke. So that's about all I'm going to do today. I had actually hoped to get a lot more done, but progress has been pretty slow. So off camera, I'm going to carry on making the rest of these panels, and in the next video, I can start to make it look more like an annoyingly small home. Oh, you're back. In this video, I'm going to be doing even more sound deadening. Not really, that was boring as fuck. In case you forgot, here's that episode. Also, as usual, if this is your first time here, here's the first episode for you to feast your eyes on. So what's happening today? I'm going to figure out how to make a floor, plug holes, and get stuff ready for other stuff to happen. Also in this episode, I left my camera at home. So everything today is filmed on a phone using this marvelous tripod. Now roll the recycled awkward intro. stands, the car's ready to have a floor base put in. The only problem is, I don't have one, and you can't buy them. So I'm going to make one out of ply. Then I'll try to secure it using existing bolt holes. Now you might see a slight problem here. The holes are recessed, so I'll have to make some kind of spacer to fill this gap. 
so I don't end up with a sagging, lumpy crater in the middle of the floor. So let's get on with it. Now the sensible option here is probably going to be to overlay the vinyl carpet and use it as a template. So I'm probably going to do that. So I'm probably going to have to do a bit of interpolation here. Let's hope this works. I'll also be making this panel in two halves because it's annoying getting hold of a cheap piece of ply that's 1.4 meters wide. Plus it'll be much easier to fit, but also much harder to make correctly. So let's hope I can make it correctly. I'd better get started. So how well does it fit? Like an absolute glove. In this project, there's no need to measure twice. So as this is gonna be in two halves, I have to decide where I've got to make the join. And I've chosen to do it at this fatter ridge in the middle. Simply because it's fatter and a bit better supported than the other places. It also makes it symmetrical and therefore prettier. So I'll draw a line and measure it and mark it so I can then use it as a datum point. So what's a datum point, I hear you cry? Google it. So now it's just a case of doing the exact same thing for the other side. Now about those recessed mounting holes I mentioned earlier. So that solves that problem. Now all I have to do is plug the holes left by these ridiculous seats.
So with that all drying, all the mounting holes are ready to go. All the spacers are in place. I've just got to remake this side. Don't you just love symmetry? Anyway, you don't have to watch that. For you, it'll seem like I made it in one second. So now we've got something that just about resembles a backpacker's van. I'm almost ready to throw a stained mattress in the back and go curb crawling outside the hostels. It's time for some cosmetics. I'm going to be using these self-adhesive vinyl floorboards. Now they were quite expensive, so I hope they're not rubbish. So I guess I'll have a go now. Now I'm not usually one to blow my own trumpet when I've done something, but this looks bloody fantastic. So you also notice I haven't done these infill panels yet, simply because I haven't stopped at the shop. So they'll be done for the next video. Now from what I can tell, apart from obviously the things I'll have forgotten about that mean I'll have to rip all this out again, that's all the prep work needed for this. So I can finally start building stuff on top of it. Now that's all I'm going to do today because I've spent all my energy getting a haircut. So if you want to see more, you'll have to wait until the next episode. It's that time again. Time for building things and organized chaos. Now at the moment, my workshop looks like this. So with a quick wave of a wand, I'll convert it from woodworking ground zero to somewhere I can actually do metal work in. Because that's what's happening today. So what's on the menu for today? Bed frames. I bet you're definitely not getting sick of seeing that intro. So as this is going to be the most marvellous troop carrier to ever grace the face of the earth, I need to think of a way to switch it up a little bit. So how am I going to do that? So most troop carrier conversions have the bed on the right side of the car, but I'm going to put it on the left. There's a lot of foreshadowing here, so you'll have to watch the rest of the series to see how this goes. Anyway, let's talk about this plan. These things are called floor sofas. They're sofas that go on the floor. It's basically a sofa with no legs that folds flat.
You're supposed to lie on them this way. But that's too ordinary. Now it turns out, if you get two of these, and lie perpendicular to how you're supposed to, you essentially get a double bed. Who knew? So I'll be building a frame to support all of this out of 20 millimeter square hollow section. That's square tube to most of you. But first things first, this thing needs planning. And my silly little drawings in episode one aren't as precise as I'd like them to be. So how tall and how long is this platform going to be? So I'm going to determine the height by sitting on the wheel arch and sitting up straight. Similarly to if you're getting your school photo taken or your manlet being measured. Now the goal here is to be able to sit comfortably without my head hitting the roof. Now I'm 190 centimeters tall, which means that if I can fit, then the majority of the population can fit. And if you're that much taller than me, you'll probably be spending all your money on specialist clothing rather than camping. So let's get started. So as it turns out, I need to build a 1900 by 570 by 250. So let's start chopping and sticking metal, I guess. So now I just have to make four more of those. I figured I'd offer it up first because this is one of those situations where I don't want to be making this twice. So I'll make four of these little frames. One to go here. One to go here. And then the same on the other side of the wheel arch. Moving on. Just want to point out that I used four meters of steel for this. And that's how much was left at the end. I quite like how efficiently this is all going. So as per usual, it's time to prep it and weld it together. And then make sure it fits, because that might be quite helpful. Well, 
Well, that was a bit tedious, wasn't it? Now I'm suffering from white finger and I have to do a lot of welding. So it's time for that. So that's the majority of the welding done. I just need to take some measurements around the wheel arch and then I can start making it a little bit more permanent. Oh, I just forgot that I have to make two of these. So now I'm making another one. So that's about 75% done now. All I have to do now is worry about the fourth piece because that's out by the battery box and that's probably going to give me some troubles. Let's find out why. Now as you can see the floor here dips down and the length that I want the bed to be goes about here. So I've got to bridge this gap somehow. I'll also have to do a bit of work in this corner to level the floor so everything's sitting in the right place. So I'll get everything in, get it welded, and then I'll be able to make some spacers where I see fit. Now other than cosmetics, this framey thing is pretty much done. Now I know they say, fuck off autofocus thing. Now I know they say if you have to grind a weld, it's not a very good weld. Well, I'm not good at welding. And if I don't grind the welds, whatever I put on top of this isn't going to sit flush. So I grind my welds. Now to make it fit, I'm going to have to extend these legs. This one needs to go 92 millimeters, and this one needs to go 19. And hopefully that'll be the last welding of the day, because I'm getting fed up of it. So I need to think about this with a non-tired brain, 
because it wouldn't be the best thing in the world if I welded the wrong extension onto the wrong leg. Now that I've thought about it, I'd better attach them. So let's try again to see if I've monumentally screwed up. So it fits marvellously, and it doesn't rock around at all, which means that some of my measurements might have been somewhat accurate. So let's find out a little bit more about how this is going to look when it's a bit more complete. Now hopefully this gives you a bit of an idea about what I'm trying to achieve with this. I might actually make this platform a little bit shorter because I think I might not have accounted for the thickness of the platform and sofa cushions, but it'll turn into a bed that's 190 long by flipping these out. And obviously there's a lot more stuff that I need to build to make that happen. So what's next I hear you cry? Well all this under seat space here is going to be sealed off for storage and I'll be turning these wood panels into some fold-out cupboards. I'll be making a structure similar to the bed frame, and then a table will go in the middle. Now the table is where things get a little bit more interesting, and we're not going to talk about that yet. And as I choose to seal myself away from the world, because making YouTube videos is horrendously embarrassing, I've essentially turned my workshop into a gas chamber. So I'm going to go home and get some fresh air. Welcome back to another episode. Now a few of you have been sliding into my DMs on Instagram. Asking about dimensions because they actually want to copy what I'm doing. So I'll take this opportunity to do a rundown of the last episode and give a few dimensions of the frame I made. Now I'm sure I'll take a copyright hit for this. So let's talk about measurements. This frame is 190 top to bottom width, outer 585, width of tubing 25, back to this point 511mm, here to here is 101. Made this little step bit just so it can clear now it's low. When you put it in, you can see it's really strong. Now for that intro you love so much. Since the last episode, a few things have happened, starting with some paint. There it is. It's black. I've also added some rubber feet to the bottom so it doesn't scratch the vinyl floor every time I sit on it. And I've also welded on this extra rail here to support the removable midsection, which will be made in the foreseeable future. I also had to modify the battery tray a little bit so that the frame would actually clear it and I've put in a brand new deep cycle battery. I also replaced the starting battery, because why not? Now going back to the frame, you'll probably notice it looks a bit shorter than before, because it is. I decided to knock off 50 millimeters because my head was hitting the roof. So now hopefully it'll be at a more suitable height. And due to it being lower, it was fouling on this bracket here. So I made a little step in the bar work so that it clears this and runs behind. And now it pretty much fits like a piece of Lego. It almost doesn't even need bolting down. Almost. So what's on the menu for today? Carpentry. So now that it's bolted into position somewhat, 
I can offer up the wooden panels and start finishing off the bedside. Now I may or may not have done a bit of behind the scenes preparation for this. So here it is. Now isn't that marvellous? I've also added these little hook things so I can tether the sofas to them. Now the plan for today is going to be to make the cupboards for that side of the car. I'm going to do this by making three little cupboard things. Two of them are going to be used for storage, and one of them will be in the area of the battery box so you can open it to gain access. So if you're sitting comfortably, then we can begin. Well, isn't that lovely? Now I'd better make these cabinet doors and some wooden panels for either end of the sofa bits. Are you satisfied now? Now after all that, does it fit? Yes.
So now all that tedium's done, I'm left with something that I might be able to sleep on if I was feeling particularly fruity. I think the height's quite good now, because I can sit upright. My head just touches the roof if I'm sat upright, but it's as close as it's going to get. I've now got a couple of cupboards in here for storage, which are held closed with little magnetic clasps. And so far, everything seems to be coming along quite nicely. I'm yet to attach the sofas permanently, but that's a case of literally applying two clips. Because when I do the electrical setup, they'd have to come out again anyway. But you've got that to look forward to in a few episodes' time. In the next episode, I make a place I can put my feet. You just spent this long watching someone make furniture poorly. Since the last episode, as usual, I've made a few changes to what was covered back then. Starting with cupboard handles and locking mechanisms. Let's begin with something that I hate. Locking and unlocking something every time I use it. It's just annoying. So on the Troopy, I've replaced the cheap sticky-outy nonsense with flush-mounted handles. For when you're stopped and you want access. Later on, each cupboard's gonna have a locking button for when you're moving around and rattling your fillings. Now this wasn't done in the first place, because eBay is slow, and I'm impatient. And it's still not done, because I'm still waiting for the push locks. I've also begun pre-planning the finer detail stuff, and converted this wasted space blanking nonsense, which has now miraculously acquired a door, into something that can be used in the very near future. Now it's right next to the battery box, so I wonder what could go here. It's now the very near future, so let's find out. Thanks for being patient. Now as you already know, this car came with its own battery box, pre-fitted. But I'm going to start with the fundamentals, just in case you don't know, and you want to start doing something by yourself. Now the battery box is here. And as it's already pre-wired, I'm going to use it. But for the record, I know this is not the most ideal setup for all of you, but it is for me. Why though? Allow me to explain. This setup uses an ignition activated solenoid that connects the two batteries once you turn the key. You can tell because of the ominous clicks. This is just a simpler version of a voltage sensitive relay. Now this is great because when the engine's running, the second battery is charging directly from the alternator. It also means that both batteries are bridged during startup. So you can use the secondary battery to jump the primary battery if for whatever reason it runs flat. This is a wild generalization. We're not talking about super duper DC, BC, LGBTQ, guess my gender, chargers, or smart alternators for now. Let's keep it relatively simple. Another advantage is that it also self-isolates the secondary battery when you turn off the ignition. Sounds great, right? Well, as usual, it's not all delightful fairy tales in the battery world. There are no free meals, and everything has its own list of pros and cons. Now this method works quite well if you have two identically chemistried and capacity batteries that are both brand new at the time of fitting. But I have two brand new non-identical batteries. One of them is a deep cycle. Now while they're both of the same chemistry, they are a different capacity. This means if, in the unlikely event that I leave the ignition on for a long period of time, the battery charge will balance itself between the two. The alternative solution is to use one of these. This is a DC-DC charger. 
The advantage of this is that it avoids the risk of battery balancing, like I just mentioned. And if you're in that rare event of forgetfulness, you're safe, as most chargers are set to operate only when the engine's running. The disadvantages, though, are that your battery will only charge at the rate specified by your charger, which is typically less than your alternator can charge. You also lose the ability to bridge your battery connections, unless you add some more fancy fat cables and doohickeys. So this is why I've chosen my method. Firstly, it's simple. Secondly, it's already there. And thirdly, it's perfectly fine as long as the batteries are healthy and I'm not forgetful with the ignition switch when I stop. Now you're all experts on how to fill your batteries up with electrons. So now let's talk about how to empty your batteries of electrons. Starting with all the lovely toys I'm going to be using. Now being a typical four-wheel drive addict, I watch some very generic shows on YouTube. And aside from the force-fed garbage that is sponsors and advertising, they all have the most ridiculously over-the-top 12 volt setups you could ever imagine. This could turn into quite a long video. Let's discuss myth number one. This could be the only myth, but I'd better number them just in case there are more later on. Myth number one. You don't need an entire room for your 12 volt setup with 300 amp hours of battery power. Even these internet people with cameras and equipment are overkilling it. But they're paid to tell you that you need a 2000 watt, $1 per watt inverter to charge your phone once a month, and 12 4K displays to show you your battery usage, and a 4G connection to upload it to the cloud. So before we actually do anything, let's learn some basic maths. Now children, firstly, power is watts. And power is also equal to your voltage times the amps. This means if you want to calculate watts, all you do is your voltage times your amps. Simple, right? Congratulations, you are now an electrical engineer. Now using this amazing newfound knowledge, let's do a case study. Now if this photo is a photo of your setup, then you're either part of the problem or a victim of it. So let's use this other photo as an example. So what's he working with? So it looks like he's got a thousand watt inverter, a giant battery manager, three breakers, one low amp fuse box, a battery monitor, some obsolete plugs he's never used before, a shunt, and some solar inputs. And at that, half of his car is gone. Now maybe you think this is the pinnacle of 12 volt joy. And if you do, that's fine. But I'm pretty sure the Troopy setup will do everything just as well as the hype beasts but without the cost or real estate. Anyway, this is starting to sound a little bit ranty. I like four-wheel drive action. Let me come on your show so I can kill your vibe with my lack of enthusiasm. Moving on. So planning here is key. I need to figure out all the stuff I'm gonna be running off my secondary battery. And the list is something like this. Next, I have to think about what the current draw is when everything is maxed out. You can think of power like a bank account you withdraw cash from. Once you run out of cash, your electricity shuts off. But only if you've done it properly. If you don't do it properly, there's a fire and an insurance claim. So the same comparison applies. I plan to run everything through a 100 amp shunt. More on what that is later. And using our impressive maths, we can work out that that gives me 1200 watts to play with. Now a thousand watts of those will be immediately eaten up by the inverter and it leaves me with 200 watts of 12 volts to play with and that will be used to power maybe a fridge and the lights. And just remember that these values are the maximum possible values. It'll never actually realistically run under these conditions. Now to put all this together, I'm going to use the following stuff. A thousand watt inverter, a 12 volt low amperage fuse box, a 100 amp breaker, an electronic RAM, USB plug sockets, 12 volt LED lights, and a load of other electrical nonsense. So now that I've got everything, I need to figure out where to put it. So I'm gonna try and keep everything compact enough to fit on this piece of wood. So let's begin. I 
So this is how the basic setup is going to be. I've got it all right next to the battery. There's the 12 volt fuse box here, a breaker there at the back, and the inverter here. But with the wooden panel on top, that's going to be inaccessible, I hear you cry. But that's what we'd like you to think. So that'll give you easy access to the fuses and any of the inverter plugs, if you need to. But hopefully, you won't. Now on the opposite side of the car, this frame has now been made, and some of the electrical stuff is going to branch over to here. And will look something like this. But how do you get power to that side of the car? Well... <clears throat> well... The genius who designed this system... Me left a channel under the floor where you can run cables from one side to the other. So everything needing to be powered from this side can get its power from here. Now a quick word for the wise. If you're going to wire a plug wrong, make sure you do it wrong at both ends. this screw. You know that feeling when you know you put it somewhere nearby, but it's in fact disappeared into another dimension. I'm sure in post-production I'll find out where it's gone, but until then, fuck you screw. This lovely little thing is called a shunt and it connects to your negative terminal and if you connect one side to the battery and everything else to the other side 
you're able to plug a computer in so you can measure the power draw, which is then output to this little screen. And if you feed it some basic information like your battery capacity, it'll show you your voltage, your remaining amps, and how long you have left of use at your current drain rate. And that's the end of the shunt. I'd better order another one. So now I guess it's time to power up some stuff and see if it works. Now the next thing on the list is an electronic actuator. Because every car needs an electronic actuator. If you're one of the few who doesn't know why, find out in a few episodes time. Now these rams work by varying the polarity of the voltage you're applying to them. So if you apply a positive 12 volt charge, it's going to extend. But then if you swap the positive and the negative and give it a negative 12 volts, it'll then retract again. Now obviously we don't want to go removing terminals and swapping things every time we want it to go up and down. So what you can do is use a pair of relays, and if you wire them in a certain way, you can use them to reverse the polarity of your switch. Now as that sounds like something in the distant future, I'm not going to do that today. What I am going to do is solve the problem of it being a little bit dark in here. With some of these. But we'll have to save that for another episode. So you're all excited to hear about my electronic RAM and where I'm going to extend it. Well, that's not going to be happening today. Instead, I'm going to make a place where I can make some steamed hams. At this time of year, at this time of day, in this part of the country, localized entirely within your kitchen. Yes. May I see it? Only if you watch the whole episode. Now while I put a lot of effort into the research for the things that I do, there are inevitably going to be times when I miss things. The result in my last video was overlooking the caravan and RV regulations. Now these state that a double pole socket is required for any 240 volt outlets. This basically means if you're using 240 volt stuff, two of the three wires need to be switched, as opposed to the regular one. Now while I know Australia loves its rules, regulations and paperwork, this means technically the car would have been legal as it was, as it's classified as a personnel vehicle. But I know it's going to be used as a caravan, or RV. And as such, I'd like it to be as good as it can be. Because in this case, they're probably there for a reason, and who knows how many camping babies stuck their tongues in previously single pole electrical sockets. Anyway, these plugs have since arrived and I've already fitted them. So to those of you who shared your knowledge and brought this to my attention. You smart, you loyal, I appreciate that. Go buy your mama a house. The moral of this story is, if something's rubbish, be a critic, because I always want to know where I've gone wrong. Anyway, this took a little bit longer than expected. Now as usual, I've done a bit of extra work in the background since the last video. Firstly, the non-regulation switches have been switched for double pole switches. Also, in case you hadn't noticed, I now have lights. As you can also see, 
I've covered the frame on the opposite side, so it looks somewhat like underneath the sofa. You may have already noticed a new addition. Introducing some controversy. This Land Cruiser is going to be equipped with propane and propane accessories. I'm about to bust. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought this was the bathroom. Oh, good lord! Apparently, burning LPG creates carbon monoxide. And in case you didn't know, that's not so good for you. Now this doesn't occur if a complete burn happens. Now carbon monoxide isn't always made. If the propane burns completely, then this isn't the case. However, this isn't always the case in an enclosed space, such as this one. Now if you're stoichiometrically inclined, you can see what I mean from these two combustions here. As you can see, the complete burn produces carbon dioxide, which isn't particularly harmful. But an incomplete burn has this little stowaway here. Now this appears when you don't have enough oxygen present in the burn. And the result is, you might end up a little bit dead. So to summarize, if you start creating this gas in an enclosed space, then you're never going to find out what happens to my electronic RAM. Speaking of which... After lighting your butane soldering iron in the normal way, you can go about doing the wiring on your electronic actuator. For those eagle-eyed among us, try to spot the obviously intentional mistake which has now been rectified. If you'd like to know how to wire a reversing polarity switch yourself, just watch these last few seconds over and over again in slow motion. Anyway, back to the oven. To mitigate the risks we just talked about, I'm going to be placing the oven as close to the largest door as I can, as well as right beneath a sliding window. It also won't get used unless the doors and windows are open. Now as we're aware, Sometimes stupid people do stupid things unless you force them not to. So to counteract this, I'll be fitting a second wheel carrier here. Because I just so happen to have another one lying around from the 76. Because nobody needs two spare tires. Now the reason behind this is to turn this second wheel carrier into something that can hold other things. And in this case, it'll be the gas bottle. Because if you can't use the oven while the doors are closed, then you can't gas yourself. Now this is slight overkill, because it's only a small burner. And something like this is unlikely to do any damage, unless it's severely abused. Secondly, it might be uncommon knowledge, but ovens get hot. Combined with a proximity to wood, it could be a recipe for disaster. Now to counteract this, I've left as much of a gap as humanely possible and minimized any contact with the wood. I've also left about a 100mm gap behind. So time will tell if this is going to be suitable. I'll test it later by turning the oven up to max and seeing if anything melts or catches fire. The car also came with this. So I should be covered. Now another thing this oven needs is a neighbor. Now I'm usually an advocate for good quality equipment. But unfortunately, Ryobi is the only company that seems to make something that fits exactly where I need it to. So as much as it pains me to admit it, this is the most ideal solution. Much better. So this little thing is going to be an all-in-one kitchen unit, complete with a water tank, water pump, as well as a sink. So obviously it'll need to be modified to fit all this stuff. So this little unit is going to go here, and as you can see, it's not made of wood, so therefore it might not catch fire from the oven. Now the slight issue is what you might see here. Now that's not a very aesthetic gap now, is it? So what can I use this space for? Now isn't that marvellous? Now at the moment, with the way these off-the-shelf components are slotting together, I feel almost like Ricky Gervais's interpretation of God. Hold on, we can do something like this. There you go. Hold on, we can do it. There you go. You're a daddy long legs. I'm a what? Now this tank is only 10 litres. 
and you're probably screaming at your screen saying that that's not very much water and I'm going to die of dehydration. Well, this is intended to be more of a weekend away vehicle rather than a this is my home forever. And from my experience, 10 liters is absolutely fine for a few days. A few years ago, I took 20 liters for a 10 day trip to Fraser Island and wasn't even close to running out or turning into human jerky. It also means I'm eliminating the risk of leaving 50 liters of stagnant water when it's not being used, as well as the huge weight saving. And let's be honest, those of you with huge water tanks, when have you ever come close to emptying them on a weekend trip? Unless you're having a water fight or washing your car in the bush. Comment your hatred and disagreement below. Now if any of you are avid watchers, you'll know that I made a short video asking for suggestions of what to do with this space. Now while there were some good suggestions, unfortunately I've had to ignore them all because I remembered I've overlooked the fridge part. Now I doubt any fridges exist that would fit in this spot precisely, but I found one that fits. But it's a horrible cheap brand. Anyway, it's arrived. And here it is. It's almost like I planned this. Now the closest suggestion to what ended up actually happening was this one. So you win the prize for today. So with all the formalities out of the way, I better actually do something today. Starting with having a go at that kitchen unit thing. So the first thing I'm going to do is attach the water tank. Now in the future, I'll definitely be bolting that in again in a more substantial way because tech screws are bloody rubbish on sheet metal like this. But here's how a mock-up of the left side of the car is going to look. Now once again, progress has been halted by Australia Post from this point. So the last thing I'm going to do today is finishing off the bed base to be modified in the future. That was a foreshadowing hint.
So this is now starting to look like a bed platform. The sofa will fold out like this. Now this removable section is a little bit cumbersome and it would be quite nice to have something that turns into a table in here but I'm going to have to go away and have a think about how to do that. I've decided that one of my next videos is going to be a Q&A because they're easy and I've never done one before. So before we start this week's presentation, I invite you to ask anything you would like to know in the comments below. Now you can ask anything ranging from the 76 to the Troopy, or stuff about my workshop machinery, or why do you still feel guilty about your parents' divorce, or is it still gay if you don't push back? Tonight, a dead cat gets a haircut. I'm finally able to lift my wallet. And lots of stuff gets pointed at. It's time. It's reached that point in time when we're finally going to find out what's happening with this little ram thing. And here it is. I'm going to use it to very slowly open the rear door. Now it doesn't open or close the door fully, but unfortunately this is something I'm just going to have to deal with. Not really. I'm going to use the RAM to turn my bedroom into a kitchen at the push of a button. Now there are a few ways I can do this. I could take out this plank and replace it with a table. I could make the bed lift directly upwards, but that would make getting in a bit of a contortionist exercise. Or I could do my usual and make something over complex to do almost the same job and add a lot of extra effort for minimum advantage. I have chosen this option. To the computer. So most of the things that I make that involve more precision than hitting two rocks together are made using CAD. That's cardboard-aided design. <laughs> I'm not sure why every single channel that contains any kind of fabrication uses this pun. It makes my wife scream and my children cry. Anyway, CAD means computer-aided design. And you can use it to make stuff digitally, as well as test stuff without having to make a load of scrap metal failed prototypes in the process. It's also a great way to visualize stuff. This doohickey is going to turn my bed into a table at the push of a button. It's been designed around the RAM's shortest and longest lengths, meaning that it should turn off automatically at both the top and bottom without tearing itself apart. Bold claims, right? So let's figure out how to use computers to turn digital stuff into real stuff. Now it's quite simple really. In this case, I want to make this little tab here. So if I open it, there it is. And now it's just a simple case of reaching in and grabbing it. Now unfortunately this only works on the smaller parts because some of them are bigger than the screen, so you have to do this in other ways. Introducing CAM. To summarize the next part, all we're doing is converting CAD into CAM and pressing the GO button. But this is how it works. Now this CAD software doesn't speak the same language as my CNC plasma cutter. The CAD software speaks I know how it looks language. And the plasma cutter speaks I know how to copy that and make it language. So in order to make something, you need somewhat of a Google Translate to help the machine and computer talk to each other. It gets worse. You need two of them. The first part converts the I know how it looks language into a series of instructions. This then needs to be converted into instructions specific to your machine, because unfortunately they're all a tiny bit different. The last step is called post-processing. This is where a lot of expensive mistakes can happen. Hopefully that won't happen today. 
This is where you set all your parameters like backlash, speeds and feeds, and all sorts of other stuff. But if you get it wrong, then you need a mortgage. Anyway, if you're into this sort of thing, get a copy of Fusion 360. It's free if you're not using it for commercial use, and it combines the first two steps very well. However, as I'm a bit awkward, I use a slightly more versatile standalone CAD package. But Fusion is a good one-stop shop for people playing at home. But all it means is that I have to do an extra step to convert my files into Fusion files. Anyway, once you've got your CAD, you can make your instructions. Then we're just about ready to feed it into the post processor and press the go button, where lots of fire and molten metal happens. Sounds good, right? Have a montage. Anyway, for more about this machine, check out this video. You might notice something. It doesn't seem to fit together right now. And to solve this, I've bought some bits. Typically, you'd mount these bearings like this. But what this does is put an excessive bending moment on the bearing when it's not supported at the other side. So I've decided to use them wrong and mount the bearing inside the metal so that the force is transmitted with a minimal bending moment on the bolt. So I've got some welding and bolting to do. Have yet another montage.
So this is it. My weird pivoting platform thing. But how can it pivot using only an electronic ram that can only move in and out? Well prepare yourselves for the most effort I've ever put into any video stuff with the magic of overlaying. So the bed slash table is going to be bolted on here. The other end will be bolted onto the car. And as we know, the ram pushes in this direction. And as you can see, the ram isn't pushing perfectly horizontally, meaning it has both a normal and a tangential force. In turn, this pushes in two directions at the same time on the arms and creates a moment around these bearings. Now because the parts are quite strong, they don't distort and the reaction forces are taken up by the bearings as they're the path of least resistance. This arm is in tension while the other's in compression because of the table acting on the structure. And when all these things combine, the result is as the ram extends, everything pivots, lifts up, moves backwards. And as the arms are all equal lengths, the top platform stays completely level. In theory. Now that was probably a very garbled explanation. So if you're interested in things explained better, type engineering mechanics into Google. So as this definitely got assembled first time without any issues at all, it's time to test it. Now as you can see it works outside of the car, and as you can also see it needs some improvement. And what I'm going to do is reinforce these arms so there's no flex in them, as well as adding a pivot point for the ram that isn't an allen key. Now with the joys of video editing, this can all happen when I clap my hands. So now that that's all fitted, all that's left to do is push the button and see what happens. We've run out of time. You'll have to find out in the next episode. How's that for a slice of fried gold? So now you know fully how this RAM is going to be used. Use this series as an example of how to drag something not particularly interesting over nine episodes. Now that the interior is completed in a very basic sense of the word, it's on to the next part of this build. Removing everything all over again. What kind of sadistic nonsense is this? Well, there are a few areas that I want to tidy up that haven't been shown on camera because I float like a brick, stink like brie, and the viewers can't critique what the eyes can't see. I'm also aware that the table thing makes access to the sink a little bit troublesome, but that's something I'll just have to live with for now. In the meantime, dishes will be done in the style of a nun, although it's not the most comfortable thing in the world. Anyway, 
The main reason for removing everything is to do the following things. Paint the cut battery box. Fit the shunt without exploding it. Add the storage push locks. Mount the 12 volt slide properly. Lacquer the wood. Bit of laser engraving. Little interior paint touch ups. Using up the rest of my sound deadening. Installing the RAM wiring properly. Generally cleaning up. Stripping the doors and cleaning up everything in the door jams. Replacing this horrendous window pinch weld. Amongst other things. And on that note, let the stripping commence. I also fitted the sink, by the way. Delightful. Now I'm well aware painting with a brush is not the best surface finish you're ever going to get. But this is purely for rust prevention. Because as we all know, this is all hidden away anyway. Now as usual, it's time to use some relatively obscure machinery. Now this is a laser engraver. and they're bloody cheap and quite good. So I'm gonna use this to engrave the switches on this piece of wood. And it's literally that simple to set up. You pretty much just choose the picture you want and where you wanna put it and press go. Now as I'd rather not destroy a very expensive camera lens, I'm not gonna record laser engraving. But if you like, you can see the green flashes sped up. So I'll do that a few more times and then I can put some varnish on it. I forgot something. Much better. So now I'm pretty much in the position that I was a month ago, and I have some lovely things like this to tidy up. Now in other news, my shunt is now finally working. So that's something, I guess. Now most of this wiring is just extending wires from one place to another, and adding fuses in a more convenient place. So there's not really that much more to say about it. So this is how I'll leave it for now. I'm well aware it's not exactly perfect, but it's definitely functional. I've got fuses for the fridge, the shunt, and the light. What I'll probably end up doing is putting a breaker here as well, just in case there's a short between the inverter and the battery. Afterwards, I've got to sort out the wiring on the other side. 
for some reason, some genius decided to wire the reverse camera so that it's on all the time on the second battery. So I'll have to reroute this to the front into the engine bay and run it off the accessories box. But for now, I can consider that done until I start putting everything back together again. So that concludes probably the shortest episode to date because I'm sure nobody wants to watch me do tiny little jobs here and there that nobody even knew about in the first place. So in the background, I'll gradually work my way through the list and with any luck, there'll be something a bit more impressive to look forward to afterwards that doesn't involve me. That's foreshadowing. It's been a while since much video stuff happened to this creature. Mostly because annoying little tidy up jobs don't make for good YouTube content. And making content worse than this is probably not in my best interests. But most of that stuff is done now, except for some hideous little things that you're about to find out about. So if you've ever done any work on cars, you'll know that tiny little things can become day ruiners. In this case, I found a patch of rust about the size of a 50 cent coin. That patch of rust has since become this. So this coin sized hole has become the size of a novelty check. So in this episode, I'm going to sort this out, amongst other things. Also, if you're a lazy and unskilled degenerate of society, do not work on cars, ever. And if you find a rusty hole in your car, do not fill it with expanding foam, because it takes an extremely long time to get it all out again. Ask me how I know. So this is a video about bodywork, and I'd like to add that it's not a tutorial. This is just what I find to be an effective method for fixing bodywork like this in the long term, without using any body filler. So I shall begin with a steps counter. So step one, chop out every single bit of rust that you can find. You can't really cut corners with this step because there's welding involved. And if your weld touches rust as you're doing it, it'll dissolve like candy floss in water. Now for this part of the video, I accidentally ran over my ear defenders. So I choose tinnitus. So as this is a sill, I've got to make this in two halves. Firstly, I'm going to make the back side, which will then allow me to weld the more cosmetic side onto the other side of it. So this piece of the infill is done now. I've cut it down to size and that fits up pretty nicely. Now let's move on to step two, because I forgot I was doing steps. This is the main event. Welding stuff in. Now one of my previous videos received a copyright complaint for using a piece of music that I didn't own. I can't imagine which one that was. The princess is here. See, this frame is 100 miles. So for this section, you can enjoy some fully homemade music from around 15 years ago, when I was a little bit more strange. You can blame the YouTube algorithm for this. Let's give you an intro. If you're still here after that, then it's back to business as usual. So that's the more difficult side done. But this side needs a bit more care and attention because it's the cosmetics side that people are actually going to see. So I guess I'd better get on with that then.
that's sort of how you fix body panels. So I've still got a lot of tidying up to do. I'm just in the process of blending it in now. And then I've got to go about fixing this other hole. The good thing about the location of this repair is that there are plenty of body plugs in this area. So I can quite happily get inside and paint the back of the welds to stop them rusting. And aside from that, the things that I'm not going to do on camera, that's just about all the body prep that I'm going to be doing for this project. Now for an announcement that might shock you. This car is getting a full respray. Which is the main reason why all this stuff's happened. As well as why there are so many pieces missing from the car already. I also decided this due to the fact that touching up all the stone chips and little scratches on the car would be an absolute false economy. So on that note, I'm going to completely strip the vehicle exterior and get it ready for this to happen. So this stripping process will probably expose me to many more unpleasantries, as well as a lot of the spiders I've seen crawling around the bodywork in my travels. So prepare for that, with the chance of me shrieking. I'm being cautious because this looks like a palace for brown recluse spiders. If anyone gets that reference, then you win the prize. Now you can see why they call it a raised air intake instead of a snorkel. The only thing sealing this is the pressure with this little foam pad and there's no way that's going to stop any water. So if you're following my Instagram, which all of you definitely are, then you'll see that I've picked up this little box. Now that's going to do the shower and gas supply and a lot of other things, but that's coming later. For now, everything comes off.
wasn't very glamorous. So from what I can tell, that's everything I'm going to do. Now in the next episode, hopefully there'll be more people involved who aren't me, who are much better at doing cosmetics. Since the last episode, the car now looks like this. And in case you missed that episode, here it is. Now the cliffhanger that I left you on that only I care about was that this car is getting a respray, and today is that day. Now while I'm very confident at making stuff and fixing stuff, I'm not particularly good at making it look good. So the best option from here on is to give it to someone who knows what they're doing, and they're gonna take over from here. So I've been in contact with The Toy Shed, and they've been my go-to guys for everything relating to cosmetics and prep work. And at their advice, I've been doing a bit of prep work in the background, just to make it a little bit easier come spray time. So on that note, with the car in its current state, I've got an extremely long and highly illegal drive ahead of me. So let's get that out of the way. So with the car delivered, I'll hand you over to our infield reporter, me. Thanks, me. So I'm in the toy shed, and I've managed to convince these guys to spray my vehicle for me. So this video is a little bit backwards. We've already finished doing the job, but here's Blake and Luke to tell us what we're about to get on with. <laughs> so basically today, we, we started with a, a stripped down car. Matt was kind enough to do most of the masking work for us and most of the prep work, which made our jobs a lot easier. Um, kind of gave him some pointers on what to use in sanding and he, he opted with the orbital, which is what we always tend to use, especially doing something like a Raptor job. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a pretty straightforward job, real easy application. Uh, I mean, the body work was pretty good. Matt spent some time cutting some rust out, replating it. Um, obviously, picking out all that foam, which was awesome fun for you. It was hideous. <laughs> Someone made a poor choice in filling it with the expander foam. Um, but I think overall we've got a pretty good outcome. And yeah. so I hope you're happy with it. So before anything started in terms of adding paint, Blake and Luke gave the car a thorough looking over just to see if there was anything that I'd missed. And as it would happen, there was. So they spent a bit of time sanding some of the bits that I'd missed, masking the bits that I either hadn't done or had missed on the windows, and just making sure that the final result was going to be as good as possible. So to start with, the sanding's done to roughen up the surface, which helps the paint stick better. And after blowing the whole car down with compressed air, the whole thing's wiped down with degreaser, just to make sure there's nothing to stop the paint sticking. Now before all this, any rust spots were removed.
in this episode. I finally get registration. A swap happens. And I decide to... I'm Andrew Cynthia White. And I decide... Join me as I share my passion. And I... These videos are made possible by contributions from Patreons. You don't have the best two-person overland vehicle in the world. I do. I'd better dispose of this more responsibly. So as you can see, it's pretty much finished, and there it is. So let's take a look at it. So this video is going to be quite uncomfortable for me, because I forgot my camp chair. Anyway, what this is, is yet another V8 4.5 litre diesel Land Cruiser, but this time it's a 78 series. So firstly, this is the result of a build series. And if you haven't watched it yet, then you're cheating, and you should go and watch it right now. Click that little clicky thing to see it. So now that that's out of the way... Let me show you its features! So on the front, as you can see, I've got an ARB bar. I chose this because it's lightweight. Don't be silly, it's a troop carrier. It'll never be lightweight. I chose this because it was already on the car when I got it. As well as these spotlights. But I think they're quite good. Although the only thing I'd change about it is that it doesn't have a winch. Now some of you might call me out for contradicting myself. Because in a previous video, I mentioned that I think every car should have a winch. But this one doesn't because I haven't put one on yet. So this is the engine. It's just like any other one. And all I've added is a catch can. Now I purposely haven't added a secondary fuel filter because I don't think they have all the advantages people say they do. So my compromise is to replace my fuel filters more regularly, but this one stays as is. In the future, if I decide that I hate money, I might end up getting a new clutch and a tune on it, as well as an EGR delete. So as you can probably see, it's not sitting at standard height, and this is because it's got a 2 inch lift, as well as 285 tyres. Now the problem with this is that the previous owner put some offset rims on it which meant that my front tires stuck out like a sore thumb. So that's what this horrible thing is for. I got a blue slip yesterday. Now the back of the car is where things get slightly more interesting. And by interesting I mean weird. Starting with this thing. So this little plate is a hub that I made so that I've got easy access to my airlines and gas pipe work. Spoiler alert, there's a compressor mounted inside. There's also a gas inlet for what we're going to talk about soon. Now the other good thing about this is that it doesn't protrude past the bodywork like you see on all the other vent kits by other companies. Now this one's just a prototype, but I'll be working on a much better one that I'll actually be able to sell in the near future. I also have a weird box on the back. Now on this side, I keep my gas bottles, which feed to that hub we just talked about. And in the other side is a shower system, because this is a glamping vehicle after all. I also have a high lift jack because I hate my fingers, 
and a tiny shovel for poos. So there's nothing really on this side, but I'm just going to talk about the paintwork. Now this is Raptor liner paint, and as you might know if you've watched the other videos, I did a collaboration with these guys to respray it, and I think they've done quite a good job. So when these guys did the paint, they painted it with a slightly higher pressure than normal, and what this does is give you a smoother finish. But because they've done this a few times, they managed to get it extremely consistent, which is why I wanted them to do it instead of me. The other things they did were add little details that nobody would think of that I think are bloody fantastic. So that's just about everything to do with the outside of the car, except the roof rack. There it is. So let's take a look at the inside, because that's a little bit more interesting. So what we've got here is what looks like your standard troopy setup. On this side is a floor sofa and these fold out. Now that gives you your sleeping space. But what's this? Well it's an oven because this is a glamping vehicle and everyone needs roast dinners on a Sunday. So what we've got is this oven. Next to that is a little kitchen thing with a sink and a water tank. This one's for drinking water only, and it's got a little 10 litre tank in behind there. Now the drain for this is just behind here. You probably can't see it. But it comes out just in front of the rear diff. And next to that is a fridge. Let's look at it from the other side. So this is the cheapest, smallest brass monkey fridge that I was able to find, which just so happens to fit perfectly in here. It's also really good, so don't let the price fool you. But what's this? So I've decided to take this inside, because somehow, on a day like this, it's now raining. So what you can see here are various controls for things. This is the light switch for the interior lights. These are the controls for the bed thing, which we're going to get to later. This is a 240 volt power socket, powered by this inverter, which I'll show you in a minute. And that's about it, because that's already too many controls. So I built this car as a weekend overland vehicle that I can go on further away trips if I wanted to. But I also hated what I saw on other troop carrier builds, namely having to assemble your furniture if you wanted a table or a bed. So here's what I came up with. Pretty cool, right? Now what this means is that when I'm traveling, I can eat dinner like a civilized person but it also means that I can go on trips while I'm supposed to be working. So this, combined with my 12 volt setup, will allow me to stay pretty off-grid. So let's take a look at that setup. So I originally designed this bed table thing to fold away the sofa beds as well. And while it works, it seems like it's almost going to tear itself apart. So here's a look at that, and you might see the reason why want to use it like that. So for now, I'll just use it while the beds are folded. So I just remembered to show you the 12 volt setup. I have to raise the table again. But anyway, the 12 volt stuff is under here. Now under there is a load of 12 volt fuses and a 1000 watt inverter that feeds to that other control panel that we talked about earlier. Now to the left of that, in here, is the deep cycle battery and that's fed from the engine bay. Find out more about that in my previous video about 12 volt stuff. 
I forgot to mention anything about the driver's interior, but as you can see, as it's the older model V8, it's still got the steel dashboard. But what I've got here is a single DIN Android head unit, which fits in there pretty nicely. And below that is a GME 40 channel. But apart from that, in this area, rather than modifying everything, I've chosen to make it pretty tidy. I guess the last thing to mention of any merit is the reverse camera here. And that doubles as a rear view mirror. And while you might think it's useless to have it on all the time, it's surprisingly useful. Now I have overlooked one thing that you may or may not have noticed. Troop carriers do not typically have three passenger doors. This one does. And at that, you found pretty much the main reason why I bought this thing. Anyway. I forgot to mention that I've also got a Kmart rear bar strapped to the back of this thing. But you've already seen that. But that's what brand it is. I sell those. Now there are a few other things that are going to be happening in the future. One of them is a water heater. But it's not your average one. Now this monstrosity is hopefully going to be an inline water heater. This is just a series of half inch 90 degree fittings with glow plugs in them. Now the theory is you heat the glow plugs which then heat the water as it flows through. The water is going to feed in this end with a pump and hopefully come out here not cold anymore. Now to be honest, I'm not expecting this to work particularly well. I'm not expecting burn yourself hot water to come out of it, more along the lines of something that isn't completely cold. Now each of these glow plugs draws about 12 amps of power, and the goal is to run it through a relay which is activated by the accessories port, meaning you'll only be able to heat the water while the engine's running. Now seeing as you've watched my other videos, and you're all now electrical engineers because you know this, you'll know that 12 times 8 is this, and that's how much power this thing alone is going to draw. Now what you'll find if you search for glow plug water heater on YouTube are a lot of people with many syllable names trying to heat a bucket of water with a single glow plug and then saying it doesn't work. But the fact of the matter is, if you apply more energy to water than is lost, then the water will in theory heat up. So once I finish putting this setup together, I'll be testing it out and seeing if it works. So that pretty much concludes the Troopy. So what I'm going to do is go and drive the thing instead of making little YouTube videos that are embarrassing to do in public. And as I'm in Arumba State Rubbish Tip, it seems like I'm in the perfect place to do it.